Hello, everybody. Welcome to the 77th episode of the Manor Podcast. I'm your co-host, Roger Bowdy, joined as always with my best friend and other co-host, Michael Hamilton. Michael, do you have any mantras or life mottos you usually go by? Um, Mantras or life mottos? Not really. I don't, nothing that like re- mm. recurringly comes to mind. Can you think of mind. any of mine? I, I have a couple. What do I usually say in a car when something bad happens? Uh, <laughs> All's well that ends well. <laughs> uh, usually, is that what or, you say? oh my God, Michael, I can't believe you're swerving into this truck. Please stop swerving to this truck. Please. Oh my God, please no. <laughs> that, that one sounds familiar. <laughs> Followed by all's well that ends well. <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, and then a second one that I often think and – is uh, becoming more and more common as I get older and older is if you, you want to make God laugh, make a plan. And basically that just means that you can plan for whatever you want or do your best. But at the end of the day, fate or divine powers or God or whatever you believe in or don't believe in uh, knows what's actually going to happen and they could be wildly different. Yeah. Yeah. I, I do think it is in general good to make plans, but your plans are not like going to always happen yeah. <laughs> the way that you plan them. So why are we making a podcast episode now? What what what's changed? Why 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 do you think we're making a podcast episode now after we said we're not playing Flesh and Blood for six months and we hate the game and we <laughs> hate we everything said. about it and that the design is terrible and that we never ever want to ever touch a flesh and blood card ever again? Was I believe where we left things off? That, yeah, that's definitely what we said. Yep. Uh, so basically, for me personally, I played almost zero flesh and blood between the twenty k and the battle hardened last weekend. I had a few coaching sessions and I played some games. The battle hardened you won. You played. You did. You didn't. Is is that what you're saying? <laughs> that yes, that that battle hardened. But mm. I I really did feel like I got the the break that I personally needed. And that was a big part of why I was pretty happy to take the break is I, I never could really like disengage from flesh and blood as much as I wanted to. And outside of like the coaching sessions, I, I really was basically completely disengaged with flesh and blood for over a month. Um, but I, I think there's also a story about the battle heart and that played into us starting a little sooner than we were planning, but <laughs> I will let you tell that story. Uh, we got first and second. We met in the finals, obviously. And that's why we titled this episode, What are the odds? Because what are the odds that you and I wind up making the finals of a 130-person tournament on Bolton and Bravo of all decks? And that's pretty crazy. That's, that's, that, that, didn't, that, didn't, that didn't seem very likely. So it also didn't seem very likely that we'd start up again. But here we are. Yeah, yeah, something about plans and then things happen. So yeah, I I remember at the start of the top eight, you were kind of joking that yeah, if we meet in the finals, we'll have to bring the podcast back. Yeah, <laughs> and then it became less of a joke when you won your semifinals and I was playing my semifinals. And you drew blue, you, blue, blue, spinal crush or blue, 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 crush. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. yeah easy, I drew, easy game. I went dominate Starstruck and to dominate Crippling Crush. Uh, after the Starstruck turn, I had no arsenal. So classic Bravo. Just sometimes you just draw perfect. Yeah, if you just draw every hand is just three blues and a Crush card, is you can't. It's it's a great deck, you know. <laughs> but as a side note, I will say I felt like I was more so the driving fat force behind the break and hiatus, anyways, and a lot of it was not even flesh and blood related. You know, being completely honest and. A lot of the narrative around our hiatus fell around our dissatisfaction with the game as like the primary reason. And I don't even think that's the primary reason why I wanted to take a break. My personal life was literally a garbage fire inside of a dumpster fire, inside of a burning building, inside of a very stressful situation that was also on fire. And... (laughs) I just couldn't <laughs> couldn't handle it. I just needed a break. And basically, the the as as a person who loves metaphors, I felt like I had a bunch of balls in the air. This is me juggling balls, you know, as I do juggling balls. 
And then all the balls <laughs> fell, every single one. I had no balls left in the air other than my family. That was this one ball I managed to hold on to. And yeah, you- every, everything else was on the ground. And I had to spend the past two and a half months slowly picking up all my balls <laughs> to figure out what balls I wanted to pick back up. And now I'm holding a bunch of balls. I got a bunch of balls in my hand. And I feel like I can handle my balls again. You know? <laughs> this is a great metaphor. Yeah. I, I will say that. <laughs> Yeah, it makes sense that your family was the one you were able to keep in the air because that was something that you were really prioritizing. Oh, yeah. Like Austin is, is Austin, Angela, number, they're the first letters of the alphabet. That makes it easy to <laughs> prioritize number one. That's why, it out, you know. I didn't yeah, name, that, that's why. You did it in alphabetical order. No other reasons. Yeah, if I, if I named my son Zach, he'd be in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> I see, I see. Yeah. But I named it with an A name, so it's always easy to prioritize them. Yeah, that was just some good planning, honestly. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So you got all your balls picked up. <laughs> That's great. And then we were talking about March for a little while. Um, do you think, I guess there was also an interesting thing with our Patreon where we tried to pause it and it was like, no, I'm going to resume now. So yeah, you can only pause it for so long before <laughs> or shut it down. And then I shut it down initially and then a bunch of people are like don't shut it down we want to watch old episodes of university and where are we going to upload all these old episodes of university and then i would have had to upload so many episodes of university to youtube or something (laughs) i would have been saving so much time so i just left it up and uh then the billing came unpaused and uh at least now we get to put in the exciting finals of our battle hardened match to that patreon that's a good that's a good patreon reward i would say is seeing seeing that match play out yeah so there was no coverage of the battle hardened last Mm -hmm. weekend but roger and travis brilliantly set up a a perfect cell phone phone recording station if there's there's a pile there was a pile of deck boxes with a cell phone on top just recording our game so we're gonna go cover that game and throw it up on the patreon and quality is surprisingly good i was surprised you know I didn't think a cell phone we come a long way in cell phone videos since I was a boy. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, I don't think my cell phone could even take videos. My first phone. I think it just in pictures. Checks out. Yeah. The old flippy phones. Okay. Um, and then I guess before we get into the actual flesh and blood, Bolton Bravo talk and all that stuff, there's a couple of other podcast meta related things that we should talk about. And I guess first and foremost is that we, are not going to exclusively cover flesh and blood anymore. Uh, It's going to be whatever game we feel like talking about. And if, you know, it's the two, two, it's a month before the new set and the meta feels stale and nothing new is talking about and the drafts format solved and whatever, we're just going to, we're not going to try to force ourselves to go off the rails or talk about some inane topic that's already been covered a hundred times before and probably better on other YouTube channels. We're just going to talk about a different game. And there's lots of other games out there. Um, We're big into sorcery right now. We're pretty into that game. And we're also looking into this new Alpha Clash game. Look, This is even a foily. Look at that foily. (laughs) Uh, So those are the games we have our eye on at the moment. But who knows? There's also some QR game that I saw pop up on Twitter the other day where it's just like every single card has a QR code and that's how you register it to your collection. And uh, it seemed like an in- interesting idea. I don't have no idea about it, but it looked cool. Um, maybe we'll talk about Magic the Gathering Limited if a new limited set comes out and we want to talk about that and play at a limited arena open. This, the, the world's our oyster. Yeah, yeah. And this is mostly because it feels weird to just be forced to talk about flesh and blood especially when we are not playing a lot of flesh and blood and like i think there's times where we are playing a lot of flesh and blood and we'll have some great flesh and blood content but we we had a lot of episodes that i think we would both agree weren't really up to what we wanted them to be because neither of us were that engaged by that flesh with flesh and blood at the moment yeah or it was the week before the pro tour and we couldn't talk about anything because of team things so mm-hmm. on that front i've also stepped away there i I created a role or we created a role called part-time pack. So I'm technically still around, but I don't really contribute or look at 
anything in a meaningful way. And it's mostly just me and Steven just typing away and John now too, posting away in the Bolton channel, talking about Bolton most of the time. And that's about the extent that I work with the Wolfpack on decks anymore. So <laughs> I want to be able to, you know, ask questions, talk about what I want to do. And I even did a small proof of concept. It's not the same thing as like a pro tour, obviously a battle hardened, but I posted my almost exact 80. I think the difference was I forgot to bring yellow beamy bravado. So I had to play yellow and golfing lights. But aside from that, the 80 was exactly the same as what I posted on Twitter a week before and I got second place in the tournament. And I think I posted like technology or, or things like that, or those specific nuances don't matter as much as player skill or actually having a good deck. And I think posting my deck and getting the feedback from the people that I did, did make my deck actively better. When I first posted it, I didn't have any red illuminates in it. There were zero red illuminates in it. People were like, so good. you're crazy. Put some red illuminates in your deck. And I was like, okay. And I put some red illuminates and I was like, oh my God, red illuminates crazy. How did I not have this card in my deck? Thank you, everybody. I had five bannerets and people were like, you should play six bannerets. Like, why are you only playing five that's weird and i was like i don't know was, you don't want to flood on banneret so i played the six banneret and then i never flooded on bannerets. i just i just had enough <laughs> bannerets. What a, what a crazy world it was so wild yeah you know the the feedback that i got from everybody was good and helpful and a non-zero amount of the reason why i got second place yeah awesome uh i on the other hand have no intention of stepping away from the wolf pack i credit a lot of my success to them. We'll get into it a little bit when we talk about our decks from the Battle Hardened, but John, the John that you mentioned joining or working on Bolton with you, but he I credit him with innovating the the Bravo deck and coming up with the idea of putting Tunic in your Bravo deck and playing a bunch of the four for eights, but we'll get to that later. <laughs> okay. Sounds good. Um oh and we're taking December's off. <laughs> That's it. Every year, December, we're taking a month off the podcast. I mean, it's pretty reasonable. I feel like take some time off for the holidays, spend some time with the family. Not a lot usually goes on in December's anyways. We're just going to take December's off for the podcast. So heads up. Yeah. Uh, probably not as long of a break as we took this year, but yeah. probably just December. But Instead of two and a half months, it'll be, it'll be about three or four weeks. So there you go. All right. Is that all the podcast news stuff, meta stuff? I think so. Okay. That's all I can think of. Great. I have a goatee now. <laughs> that's a bit. That's a pretty big on the podcast meta news. I get to go mm, and stroke my goatee as I think wisely. It's. I credit this also for winning the uh, the or not winning, getting second place in the battle. Or this really helps me improve my flesh and blood game. Is going. Hmm. What do I want to do here? Hmm. Yes. Mm. Yes. It's very good for concentrating. So if you can grow a goatee, I, I would recommend it. <laughs> okay. Awesome. <laughs> so talk to me about Bravo then. Why why did Bravo win the tournament? Okay, so this is the same, basically the same deck I played at Worlds and then the same deck I played at the 20K. Um, but for Worlds, we were working on this. Well, John started working on this Bravo deck. He posted pictures. He's like, look at this Bravo deck. We just play all the four for eights. Then we tunic plus pitch a blue and play a four for eight. And they have to block with two cards. And then they still take damage. And then you're in great shape. And if you have extra cards, they're great to pummel. You just pummel the four for eights. It's a four card 12 that you get a crush effect and they discard a card. That's pretty good. Pretty good. Four card 12 of them discarding. So basically a net of three cards for 12. Good, good deal. And then where you add pummels, to your deck and you're playing tunic you get to play this classic combination of cards called commanded conquer and pummel together and you can do that pitching a single blue you play a commanded conquer pitching a blue one floating your tunic's at three you have a card in arsenal or a card in your hand if that card's a pummel then if they block for six you pummel and they kill a card from their hand they discard it or you kill their arsenal you basically get two cards from them and you deal 10 damage or 10 points of value for three cards and a tunic counter, which is way, way above rate if you're getting both the arsenal destruction and the discard. Even if you just get the discard because they crown a providence away their arsenal or they don't have an arsenal when you draw C and C pummel with your tunic on three, then you're still trading three cards for 10 damage and a card, which is still quite a bit above rate. So <laughs> three Seems card good. 10 is about rate. And then when you're getting a card back out of the deal, you're trading your tunic counter for a card from them. That's Really good. Um, 
yeah, so we kind of put those together and then we cut the worst of the four for eights. Oh, I cut the worst of the four for eights from my version. <laughs> There's still talk of playing some of the other four for eights, but I think Debilitate and Choke Slam are the only ones that I really think are worth it. You can play like Buckling Blow or Mangle, or I think there's one more that I can't even remember the name of, but. Yeah, I don't know. Maybe there's not. Maybe it's just Mulch, but that's not a Bravo card. It is not. But yeah, all those things. And then you get to do things like Rouse the Ancients with Anathos. You can tear it under Anath- Anathos. And then um, you have a bunch of blue poppers. Your drumming match was very good because you're really aggressive and you have a bunch of poppers, so they can't really block you out and develop their board at the same time because you're just dealing more damage than Bravo decks have in the past because you have Tunic, you have... Oh, we're also playing Lion's Tricks for that reason too. Is if you're spell things and all that stuff. Four or five card hand, yeah. So lots of go again, Pummels, Tunic to help fix out the curve. And then we were calling it Combo Bravo because anytime you have two of the generic two costs, like CNC and... Well, CNC and Pummel or Zealous Belting and Pummel, then the tunic kind of pays for that extra cost to make it an even like pays for that fourth resource you need. So if you go like Zealous Belting, pitching a blue and you have your tunic up, then you can tunic pummel and then still pitch another blue to Anathos and you're getting uh four card 15 with the discard trigger. Four card 15 is already above rate. And then the discard trigger is just great. So um, I jokingly called it a combo every time we did that and it kind of stuck, <laughs> but uh, yeah, so I played it. At Worlds, I think. Did you win Worlds this year? I missed that. I did part. not. I did not win Worlds this year. Worlds was actually kind of rough for me. I lost four games, I think. I think yeah. I, I lost three games of CC, so I went five and three in CC, and I five won drafts. But in Classic Constructed, I lost to azalea and dash io which i believe are both favored matchups i I don't think i played particularly well in those two games either of those games and yeah, then, Dio in particular is surprising to me but yeah it was brody brody's very good but <laughs> uh yeah I, I think i think if i was on my on my a game i think i would win that game he's so. washed up now he hasn't won a single tournament in 2024 it's been nine days 11 <laughs> yeah. days when this goes out you've already won a tournament in 2024 you know it's just, just saying. <laughs> okay. Cream always rises to the top, baby. Uh, yeah, I think I, I think I only won one tournament last year. I think I just won Indy last year. Anyway, <laughs> Brody won a lot of tournaments last year, so Brody's doing pretty good for himself. Yeah, that was last. Uh, that's, that's 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 last year's news. I'm all about 2024, <laughs> baby. Okay, okay. Um, and then yeah, it's weird. I'm going back to Worlds, but we ever actually gotta talk about that on the podcast podcasts no it was again. like the two weeks before worlds we stopped i remember being yeah. relieved because i didn't want to do a pre-worlds don't talk about anything podcast and we didn't have to make that episode so that was nice <laughs> yeah yeah that's fair so uh and then day two i lost to a uh, tree frog dash which is like the really defensive dash with a bunch of d reacts and they aren't even playing boost cards they're just playing pistol items and uh, a bunch of defensive stuff and i think that game I think that's Bravo's worst matchup, the specifically the very defensive versions of Dash. Mm-hmm. Um, you can win if you draw really well and there and your pummels line up with like basically you need your CNC pummels to not line up with their D reacts or to, to line up with their D reacts and not line up with their uh, Oasis, Oasis respites. Respite. Yeah, yeah, because it's playing a lot less attacks. They usually don't get to play reinforce the line, so. It's just the Oasis, which is a little bit more costly to cover up a CNC pummel. They have to either have a tunic resource up or pitch a full card, but basically you really don't want, you still just don't want your CNC pummels to line up with that and you'd rather have them Oasis to your other attacks. Okay. And yeah, that's a really hard matchup, but you you can win it. I did not at Worlds. And those are my three CC losses. And I was really happy with my deck choice. I felt like two of my three rounds, I lost to mistakes and one I lost to a specific version of dash, which I think is going to be less popular than the regular, more traditional hybrid dashes that are like boosting and boosting in most matches and then sideboarding a bunch of D-Reacts and pistol stuff into Bravo, basically. And I think that dash matchup is fine. I have beat it a decent amount of times. I think you, I don't think it's a good matchup, but I don't think it's like a reason not to play Bravo. Sure, makes sense. Um, 
Oh, Ice Liner is also a slightly disadvantaged matchup, but that was only now there for Worlds. Now yeah, now she's gone. So the 20K, I did a little bit of practice before the 20K. Not a lot, but I played a few games and I was very confident in the deck and I'd put a lot of work in for Worlds. So I felt like I didn't really need to do much more testing. And unfortunately, I did not test any games until Levia. I played against Ethan in the quarterfinals on a, or Ethan Van Sant on a, his Levia deck. And he just kind of like knew what the matchup was about, knew how to play. It, and I was sitting there kind of floundering and I don't think I played very well. I don't think I played how I was supposed to. And he had a pretty weak draw at the start of the game, but his scab skin leathers kind of made up for that where he rolled. Well, he had me rolling for him and the first two rolls were sixes. And then every time he activated his Gaskin leathers for the rest of the game, he ended with two or more action points. So, That's genius. Was like Using your turns. own luck against you. Cause you can't not roll super well at dice. So that was <laughs> that was one of the best innovations of counterplay Michael Hamilton I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> He's a genius. I need to play brute into you next time and make you roll all my dice. I just like when you rolled for me at craps, I won a bunch of money. It's just like <laughs> I never thought of it like that before. Yeah. Oh, it's I, a genius. Everybody else will just play brute and make you roll all their dice and they can't ever lose. It's genius. <laughs> I, I do think Ethan played really well too. Nothing to discredit his win. And I think that there's a reasonable chance I win that game if I play better. His first couple of hands were really, really weak. So I think that even with the Scabskins stuff happening, I probably win that game if I play it differently and sideboard a little bit better. But I play very few games against Levia and I've learned a lot since then. But I still don't exactly know how to play the matchup, but I'm getting better at it. I don't think it's a great matchup either. Yeah. Oh, well. It was a good run. And then you won your next tournament. How'd that go? So, what did, did you just beat everybody up? You just bravoed them, drew perfect all day? Uh, No, I definitely did not draw perfect all, all day. So I did in the semifinals. So the semifinals was mm, that's the best draw me. I've ever had. With uh, you, you drew some, some heaters against me. I, I don't think my draw against you is particularly amazing. It was just the fact that when I did draw the CNC pummel, it was when you had two D Rex and you just and the spirit <laughs> and the spirit, yeah. So, so uh, I played basically the exact same list of the twenty K as the Battle Hardened, except I cut two cards to make room for AB three because I thought Kano might be on the rise. Um, I feel like there's a lot of Kano players in the Midwest, even though I don't think a single Kano showed up to the there tournament. Were, there were, I think there was one Kano. I think there was okay. one. But, oh, well, it was probably, I, I could have had more sideboard slots. Um, and looking forward, I'm probably going to be looking to make room for more blue non-attack actions because Bolton is going to be on the rise and blue non-attack three blocks are really important against Bolton. They make the matchup a lot better. So <laughs> nobody's um, going to play Bolton. Anyway, so uh, I lost one round and it was to an Azalea again. And this matchup is supposed to be pretty good for Bravo, but I'm, having a trend where I keep losing to these Azalea players. So maybe I'm doing something wrong. Maybe I need to figure it out. Maybe I, I, I don't know. Cause I, I try to hit them and it doesn't work. And then they, they outvalue me and you can try to fatigue them, but I don't think you can without the least, staunches. No, not yeah, without staunches. Yeah. I, I have, I had one blue unmovable and then I have three sinks and two fates of that tournament. That's just not enough to really try a fatigue, fatigue strategy against Azalea. I don't think nah. so. I've been trying to hit him. Maybe that's just not a an effective strategy. Maybe you should be fatiguing him, or maybe I just need to be doing things differently. I it wasn't it wasn't recorded, it wasn't streamed, so I can't really go back and watch my Azalea games. So um if this is an important matchup in the next format, then I will put some time into learning the Bravo Azalea matchup a little bit better. Fair enough. And there was a the million ninjas. Like I would say like Phi was probably the most played deck, and there was also a but ton of katsu there yeah and i think if that's true about your meta that's a good reason to play bravo i think bravo isn't amazing in defy i think it's like it depends what their defensive package is but it's not bad it's just like probably like a even matchup maybe slightly favored one way or the other but i don't even know which side would be slightly favored but your katsu matchup is very very good because katsu has less armor than Fi. they don't get to play uh flame scale furnace and shuko blocks much better than uh, Katsu's gloves, uh, breaking scales. Mm. So I think the Phi matchup is reasonably harder than the Katsu matchup. And then you just have infinite armor to stop Katsu's on hits. He really needs to get his on hits through to trigger his ability, his hero power, and also relies on mask momentum a lot. So 
because you have such good armor that you can just stuff out his um, big bonds or his Katsu trigger turns and make him less likely to have bonds turns and just overall mitigate his effectiveness a lot with your armor suite. So, and also your crush effects are all really good against him. Crippler crush great against everybody. Starstruck is very, very good against Katsu and Fi, but Katsu especially because he has less blocking armor. And yeah, I think that's probably Katsu's worst matchup right now. I, I'm not a Katsu expert, but it's definitely the matchup I am looking for when I'm playing Bravo is when I see Katsu. So I'm like, yes. Yeah, it checks out. Yeah. <laughs> Lots of two blocks. Even if you are playing D-Rex, you're not getting value out of your flick flicks really out of Bravo very often or anything like that. Uh, yeah, it's always been a pretty nightmare matchup for, for Katsu. So that checks out. Um, yeah. So in the top eight, I played against my teammate, Ben Hannon on Leviah. And I think he got kind of unlucky, and I think my plan was a little bit better. Did Ben make him. you roll his dice, or did he roll his own he dice? He did. He he activated his Scavskins once close to the end of the game. The earlier in the game, his draws kind of didn't line up with it, and I was like pressuring him much more than I was against Ethan, where he just like didn't have good opportunities to roll. At the end of the game, he activates, or near the end of the game, he activates Scavskins, and his hand was Art of War, Graveling Growl, and the one cost. Uh, Banish three things, Boneyard and Marauder. So if he hits two action points, he has to pitch the Art of War and attack for 12 with the two attacks. And if he gets one action point, then his hand doesn't really do anything. So he, he's like, I'm using scab skins. You can roll for me. And I roll for him and I roll a three. And he tanks about gambling, gambler's glovesing for a while and ultimately decides not to. And I think maybe he should have because the game ended like one or two turns later. He just like died. So maybe he should have. If he gambler's gloves and hit two action points, then he gets to attack for 12. I'm reasonably below 12. I have to give him cards instead. He doesn't, and he just casts the Art of War, which is probably the best thing you can do with that hand once you have one action point. You could pitch the Graveling Ground, play Boneyard Marauder, and Arsenal the Art of War, but Art of War and Arsenal is a little bit awkward. But he casts the Art of War for go again and draw two, and doesn't draw an attack he can play, and uh, just transforms into Levia Redeemed. Yeah. Okay. And that was the end of that game, basically. Um, so many finals I played against Akatsu. We talked about it a little earlier. I drew amazing and just kind of dominated big things the game wasn't very close bravo just did bravo things and we played in the finals which yeah we had a good game um i don't know if you want me to talk about that one now or do you want to talk about it or we save it for university or what but it was a good game it's recorded was it a good game i lost so i don't know how good of a game it was <laughs> i liked it i had a good time and it was great that we got to meet in the finals we got a nice picture taken before the finals started yeah and yeah it was a good time turns out bolton is actually pretty good now and that's the large reason of what drew me back into the game because i was like wait a second icelander's gone the worst <laughs> worst matchup is gone and lexi's gone bolton's good and nobody and everybody's like, yeah, pff, Bolton's whatever. And I'm like, no, you don't understand. <laughs> Bolton is actually really good. And people were like, yeah, whatever. And then uh the realm. Hold on. Oh, sorry. Uh and then the realm rumble happened, and Yuki and Ellie did really well with Bolton in that tournament. But I still had some disagreements with how they were building their deck overall because I think. Everybody in the whole world loves Raiden, and I <laughs> hate Raiden. I just don't like Raiden at all. And they took a very Raiden-heavy build, and they're like, well, Raiden really struggles into Fi and isn't great in that matchup. But you know what Fi can't beat at all because there's just no disruption? It's Saber's combo. So then they sideboarded in Saber's combo and then beat up all the Fives that way. And they both had really good runs, and people are like, oh, okay, maybe Bolton's legit. And then there weren't any other tournaments past then. There were a good amount of Boltons in the battle hardened, but they all kind of died in the last couple of rounds. Uh, none of them really made it to the top eight, obviously, aside from me. And I kind of attribute that to basically I flipped the deck where I am a Sabres based deck that can board into a Raiden based package. And basically, you just need Raiden for Dromai in particular because you're just never, ever, ever, never, ever beating Dromai with with sabers. You just can't, can't do it. And that, that's always been your preferred way to play Bolton, right? Where you're maining a sabers package and you can sideboard into a Raiden deck. 
Yeah, just because Sabres is broken. He's <laughs> like, how is presenting <laughs> third, like 40 damage and gaining 12 life not like an appealing game plan to people? I don't understand. Like, it's just like you can you can play a deck that gets like this cool grindy value you're like a decent aggro deck and can do some cool interesting things or you could just win the game and it's like <laughs> i'd rather just win the game uh and i basically built my deck with that in mind and that also led to some interesting decisions overall which is one i played blues and people that was the people get i got some pushback i i listened to on the feedback from twitter like the 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 bannerets and illuminates and a couple other and, and stuff like that so a lot of people are like you're a crazy person cut all the blues and i'm like you don't understand you don't <laughs> blues blues are like the best thing you could possibly have in your hand on a combo turn if you have one blue and one yellow with a combo piece or two combo pieces like the amount of times i pitched a blue and the why blues are important is you get to Gallantry Gold costs one to activate. The hat, Warband of Bologna, costs two to activate. That makes three total resources. <laughs> Courage of Blade Hold is then free to activate, which makes your Saber Swings free to swing. And you can lead on a Saber Swing, charge your yellow card in your hand, draw an extra card, and you don't have to worry about getting go again because your Saber's already pumped from the Gallantry Gold. So you just get to have it get go, go have it get go again if you don't have spirit in play and if you do have spirit in play you're just good to go anyways you're just playing all your luminous at instant speed uh you lose a little bit of value off of that because then you obviously only get two swings with that so saber um and three things with the other one if you are if you don't have the spirit you lose yeah. a little bit of value yeah but it's still very 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 good value and powerful enough to win a lot of games and mm -hmm. then as well as that also led to me playing uh refraction bolters over um snapdragon, snapdragon scalers. scalers because then you don't need as many cards in your soul because it, it was so it, i see it happen all the time where bolton just has like one card too few in soul it's just like you're swinging with that last saber swing and but you still have like two or three swings left with your sabers and your opponent throws all their armor in front of it and you're just like dang okay i can't i could give this go again and then attack with my last saber and then that's it. Like, I just, like, I can't, I don't have any more cards in my soul, so I can't get the full value. Refraction Bolters is like, nah, dog, I got you. Like, just, it's fine. Keep, keep going. And then even once that happens, then a lot of the time, post combo, your opponent will be at like anywhere from like 10 to 4 life, or like 4 to 15, I guess, is like a better threshold. And they're just hands that just don't have good go again outlets after that, just because you're bolting with a bunch of mopey charge cards in your deck still. <laughs> And Refraction Bolters kind of lets you at least still just like swing a saber, swing a saber. So at least chip in for four damage to like get the game over a little bit faster. And yeah, I just think it adds enough value when it's actual like activation. On top of which, when you're playing Refraction Bolters, Gallantry Gold, Warband of Bologna, and Courage of Bladehold, that's one, one, that makes two, plus another two, that makes four. And then plus another two, that makes six. Six, yeah, six. Six. You know what? You want you want to have six power and threatens to blow up your arsenal. The most common arsenal destruction in the format: command and conquer. Yeah, yeah. You so you just sit on your armor. <laughs> you just don't block with it as long as possible. Just just don't. Just you're you're bolting anyways. You're already just like blocking with two cards and keeping guard <laughs> and charging anyways. Like you're just already blocking a bunch anyways. And then your opponent's like, "Aha! I see." I'm a smart person and I can recognize after all this time, my opponent, my Bolton opponent is just saying no blocks and taking 20 damage to the face. This is so weird. Now is the time I should command and conquer. And they throw their command and conquer and then you go, ha ha, six block of armor. I don't have to give you anything. <laughs> and then they're like, oh no, my whole plan of blowing up and disrupting you. And you're like, aha, no, not today, sir or madam or other person. And then you just woo, 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 big combo off and win the game. Yeah, I, I remember there was a time where because Command and Conquer specifically and getting that six break point that you weren't even playing Gallantry Gold when you were Sabres comboing because you needed Snapdragon Scalers and you still wanted to hit the six break point mm -hmm. or the six block point. Yeah, yeah. Then I was playing the, what was the old one? The Courageous, no. This is the one from Welcome to Wraith. I don't remember what they're called. The ones that you could pump your next attack, weapon attack if another yeah. weapon hit this turn. Yeah. Whatever Bracers those are called. Of Brave Horse Bracers. Yeah, Brave Forge Bracers. Yeah. 
yeah, because that was, I, I always recognized that was important. So I was giving up like six points of value on my combo <laughs> turn just in order to get that extra block, which obviously isn't worth it. But now I get my extra six points of value on the combo turn and it kills a lot of people. And I did, I wish I put in more time and it's something that I do want to figure out, I guess, especially going forward is what matchups do I actually want to Raiden in? Because mm -hmm. I was a big believer in Sabres into Bravo all the way up until the top eight of the, <laughs> the matches, basically. And then I switched. I just pivoted into Lucas playing Raiden, and it felt a lot better in that match um, just because uh, you get your six blocks of armor and you're very smart into a Command and Conquer, but it doesn't work so well when your opponent then also has a pummel to play on top of it. You, can, it doesn't, you don't cover it up anymore, and then you die a horrible, horrible death uh, mm -hmm. because you lose all your cards and all your combo pieces go away. And all your, had yeah. some life too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I tried Raiden. Um, shout out to Lucas because I was just, I was so tired by the end of that day. <laughs> he pitches a yellow and a blue and swings Anathos in the end game. Um, for, for six and I'm at eight and I'm like, okay, I was just delirious. I was like, okay, so you have one floating and no counters on tunic, no blocks. And he's like, judge, he calls a judge and he says, uh, my opponent said I have one floating, but I only, I actually have two floating, but cause he didn't have like a dice or he was just, you know, he was just pitching his cards and the judge goes, oh, okay, well, we're going to back it up to win your opponent, uh, had accurate information so they can make the correct decision. And he didn't have to do that. Like he could have just been like, no idiot, you didn't count right pummel and killed me. Uh, but he actually did a very uh, nice and kind thing to make sure that the game was, I guess, like very uh, accurate uh, sportsman, like, I guess, fair, uh, whatever you want to say. So uh, thank you, Lucas. I, I really appreciate that. And uh I, don't know. I just think it speaks a lot to his character. So just want to shout him out. Yeah. He's a good kid. Well, yeah. I guess he's not a kid anymore, right? He's 18. Mm. I think. I don't know. <laughs> he is very young, though. Yeah. He is now my favorite 18 year old flesh and blood player. <laughs> <laughs> uh, don't listen Sorry, to that, Brody. Brody. <laughs> don't listen. <laughs> Brody stole a PTI from me in the stole. top eight. <laughs> he <laughs> just beat me up it. in the finals of the, of the team one. But, but Lucas. <laughs> gave me one he, gave, oh he said God. here roger you have it so obviously i like lucas better than brody who beat me <laughs> okay so yeah that's the that's the story <laughs> on bolton and uh then we played in the finals and uh the game looked kind of close for a little while and then uh i drew a hand of just a bunch of defense reactions and spirit with your cnc pummel and then i got, took a million damage and lost a million cards and then I died. And that was just, it just kind of was the game after that. And it's just, that's just how it goes sometimes. Yeah. I think one thing I've realized about that matchup is I think how good it is for Bolton is like directly correlated to how many of your blues say non attack on them and three in the bottom right corner. I think if you don't have very many of those, it's really, really hard to beat Bolton. If you have a lot of them, then the matchup gets a lot easier. And I've been on, I've been on three warmongers for a while for, uh other reasons but that is a nice perk of having three more mongers in your deck yeah i remember when i beat you in the wolf pack tournament that we played in a while ago my deck was way different like it was much mm -hmm. more it, it didn't have raiden in it it was a lot more focused on if i wanted to play sabers into old time i would actually try to like go just value almost like fatigue where I just was like, let's just play a million turns. I have a million defense reactions. Uh, whenever you have your combo or your, your combo of command and combo <laughs> combo lined up, I'll just throw my hand in front of it and move on with my life. Yeah. Uh, it had radiant uh, footsteps, I think still in it. And that helps a lot in that matchup as well, just because then you can block for eight. And then if you have the pummel, then you have the extra two. But if not, then you're not losing that much value. Like there's just a lot of subtle things that were different about my deck that helped me in that match back then. But mm -hmm. you don't get 90 cards in your deck. You only get 80. <laughs> yeah. The, I think the decks that would be good would be very different if you had access to like 90 or 100 cards. Maybe not all very different, but like I think 
the more cyborg slots people get, the worse Bravo looks. He does not get that much out of them, and other people can really beat up Bravo if they have 20 extra slots. Yeah. Yeah, but Bolton would be broken if I just had like 10 extra slots because then I could put in like a Great Axe build in the sideboard and then I could play a Great Axe Saber Raiden build and it's just like, boom, it's just pick out, pick my weapon for the right match. But yeah. uh, I only get two out of three. Yeah. I think Kano would probably be the biggest victim of people just having extra sideboard slots. Oh, Everyone yeah, can just yeah, yeah. easily slot in oh, wait, multiple copies of Oasis and their AV3 or Spell Void or whatever their optimal setup is for equipment. Yeah, I'm liking this change more and more. 90 card decks, let's go. <laughs> you're talking my language yeah maybe maybe lss will hear this and take this idea that no, <laughs> like don't. yeah let's just let's just revamp the format change our change our game just tax for cyborg slots they're never gonna listen to a single episode or anything we have to say ever again i'm sure they hate us and rue the day that we forsake forsook forsook them and their amazing game because we were so negative about it when we left and we said that we hate them and that if we hate the design and we hate flesh and blood and why would anybody ever play this game? I think that's what we said. I, I, I don't think, I don't think that's what we said. That's I'm not, pretty sure that's I, what we said. I'll have to uh, go back and rewatch that episode, you know, yeah. but I, I, I'm, I'm pretty sure pretty that's what the community sure. said that what we said or similar to it. <laughs> and the community has never hyperbolized or gone over the top of anything ever. So I, I do think, we definitely had gripes with the game and that's like not, that's probably never going to change. I don't think flesh and blood's perfect. I think it's a very good game. I think it's one of the best card games and the organized play system is amazing, but especially like they did a really good job last year with announcements and announcing events. And now we know at worlds, they announced like PT one or PT, the two PTs of this year, like so far in advance, which like they were really receptive to that feedback. And that's awesome. But we got limited callings again. We're going to Hartford. Yeah, we're going to Hartford. Uh, to, if we, I feel like if we just waited like three weeks, we would like so much of our aggravations of the game were just have naturally like receded anyways. It's just like <laughs> Lexi was gone. They completely revamped the entire Living Legend system after we left. And like that's like, phew, I love that change. And the community was like, oh, we hate this change. There's a hypothetical person at a game store who might one time show up at my Friday night armory with the wrong living legend deck and that's just horrible that this hypothetical person might exist who cares about the entire metagame of people who are sick of a format they don't matter this hypothetical person that might maybe sometimes exist matters and it's just like come on come on it was, give me give me it, a new meta we've also already kind of seen like what that change does because the the realm 20k Icelander would have been legal at that tournament if it weren't for the change and because they they changed Icelander actually wasn't legal and it was like a really diverse and healthy metagame because this format wasn't really solved icelander was the most represented deck at worlds and had a very good performance and then she just like wasn't legal at the 20k so different things showed up Levia did great you know yeah bolton did great bolton did great yeah, yeah. look like look at all these changes that <laughs> happened and we even saw it in the middle of uh skirmish season where a bunch of heroes living legend in the middle of that and i don't think it caused any horrible issue i don't remember hearing or seeing anything that like completely threw that season off the rails if anything i heard the opposite where players were cool or excited to then start playing different decks or you know get those last few living legend points with their hero while they were still around so i think it's a phenomenal change to keeping the metagames healthy diverse and solves the issue of i think after Lexi Living Legend, there were like a thousand five hundred. It was like one and a half extra heroes could have Living Legend with the extra points that they had accumulated while waiting to Living Legend. And yeah, between like Starvo, Chain, and Lexi. Yeah, and, and Prism. Prism I think. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so it's just like think of how different the game would be had this been the way it was, and there'd be a whole extra hero like Living. Like who would that be? I, I don't know. It could be anybody. And yeah. it's just like they needed a way to address that system cleanly, and I think it does that. Yeah, I you used a lot of positive words to describe the change, but I think keeping the formats feeling fresh, like playing in tournaments where a hero was legal that already had over a thousand living legend points. I think those always felt really bad. Yeah. So excited that won't be a thing very often. Unless like a hero living legend Saturday and you have a tournament Sunday, but that's fine. I don't think it can happen like that. Yeah, well... I guess they probably don't add the points to the leaderboard, but like ProQuest on Saturday could Living Legend a hero, then you could have a ProQuest on Sunday. Uh, yeah, but that's only going to be yeah, like a you, couple extra points. That's not going to be like thousands of extra points accumulated. Unless you have a Starvo win rate in <laughs> the ProQuest. It'd be, it wouldn't be a thousand. It'd be like, yeah, a small amount. But yeah, it'd be fine. Yeah. It's, it's, it's okay. Yeah. Everything's going to work out. But could win, a hero could win Worlds at 998. 
That would never happen. <laughs> Only okay. that would only happen if LSS went back and finagled ProQuest wins to make it so that their favorite <laughs> hero didn't living legend. Didn't you know that was the reason why that happened? You know, or that hasn't happened. I thought Prism. Prism hasn't won worlds. Prism won a calling. At oh, it was Briar. Was it Briar at nine ninety eight? I thought there was a hero at nine ninety eight. Briar and Prism both hit nine ninety eight. Uh huh. I'm pretty sure, but neither of them won like worlds. They won like I think Prism won a calling at nine ninety eight, and Briar won US Nats at nine ninety eight. Sure. Yeah. There you go. Maybe not 998, though. I'm not positive. But Isn't US right. Nats basically worlds? What's the difference? So I've won worlds twice, then. That's sick. Basically. <laughs> <laughs> hmm. I, don't, I don't think that counts. Okay. Well, at least everybody out there knows that I haven't changed in these last two and a half months. <laughs> I'm basically you, the same old person I ever was. I, I, I think you are happier and less stressed, which those things co- frequently go together. But I've got never some been of the happy same in my jokes. life. That's, okay. Okay. That's never, that's, oh, I guess Austin makes me happy. I've never been happy outside of interacting with my son <laughs> in my life. Okay. If you say so. <laughs> uh, Any final thoughts before we do our first new sign off? It's good to be back. Okay. Do you think we'll make another episode next week? Plan it on it. We are, right? Or was this one bonus episode before we come back in March? I thought we were going weekly again. Maybe I'll leave it on a cliffhanger, you know? Uh, <laughs> you build know. the anticipation. Who knows if we'll come back next week? I don't know. Tune in. Keep. Make sure to hit that like, comment, that- subscribe, hit the bell, <laughs> just in case we make more episodes. And also go over to our Patreon and look at that. And just maybe we'll give some updates there. And join our Discord and maybe we'll give some updates there. Who knows what'll happen, Michael? It could. It's a, a, any anything could happen between now and a week from now yep (laughs) see you next week (laughs) especially if you always remember mind your manners thanks for watching